Okay. So, in this excellent Karpov game, we're going to be taking a look at a game from the 1993 FIDE World Championship. I believe it's the first game between Jan Timmen and Anatoly Karpov. And I got to say, this is one of those games that when I, when I studied it, it turned me on to play in the Karo Khan. It was an opening that I never thought about playing out until uh, I saw this game. And it showed that even though you're playing simple openings and you're waiting around, there's still a great depth of ideas in it with room to outplay your opponent. So let's take a look. So that's a characteristic Karakan move. Pawn lever into the center. And here's one of those notes. Um, knight d2 versus knight c3. Because I have all my e4 playing students playing knight d2 because there is a weird line with knight c3 that you can actually face like b5 or a6 and b5. So the pawn can kick the knight. So it's something like here, here, this knight's got to move to a square. And then it's a different type of game than what we'll get. Knight d2, on the other hand, there's no b5, b4. And 99% of the time, black's just going to take on e4 and transpose to the main lines anyway, which we see. Whether the knight was on d2 or c3, you'd get the same position. So why not choose the superior move order that eliminates a possibility? And if you can figure out what is the deficit with playing knight d2 versus knight c3? Please leave it in the comments. So, knight d7, and this was the Steinitz variation, and some people called it the Petrosian variation after another solid world champion. Now, a lot of people call it the Karpov variation. I understand why. Like a boss, bishop c4. Timon plays most aggressive thing. And got to remember, this is game one. Now, if he predicted that Karpov was going to be playing the Karo Khan, he willingly and knowingly went into this. This was his preparation as the most aggressive line. Otherwise, respect for him going into the nastiest stuff. E6, you got to defend F7. Queen E2, and here's a very important moment. If black plays some kind of waiting move here, like say he plays B5, attacking the bishop, it looks active, you can run into big problems here after this type of stuff. So you've got to defend e6 and f7. Knight b6 is necessary. Tickle, tickle on the bishop. Bishop runs. Now we get the knight to go away, and then finally we strike back in the center. Notice how all of white's pieces went from being very aggressively placed to Karpov's like, no, you can go away and go do something else now. The man does not like being attacked. He takes away your attack, and then he gets to what he wants to do. Prophylaxis at its finest. Grab, grab. Knight e5. So he's like, okay, my knight on b6 isn't doing anything. Your knight's closer to my king again and aggressive. I would like for you to go away. And he's like, no, I insist on keeping my knight here. He's like, okay, so everything seems to be about controlling this square. So let's put more pressure on it. And White goes, okay, well, I'm going to put more pressure on it, too. What you got? Everything's revolving around control over e5. Now, this next move, when I was analyzing the game, I love it. Because this in-between move is unnatural, but it has a great idea behind it. Bishop b4, check. Yeah, well, I don't understand why... why uh... Why is this so good? If c3, capturing can be a bit of a problem for white, because regardless of how he blocks, he's going to have a rook issue. So the natural move c3 can't be played. So if king f1, we just bring our bishop back, and he can't castle anymore. And this is just a solid and effective position for black. So then we have what was played in the game after bishop b4 checked. He blocked with a knight, so that way he'd be able to castle. Karpov takes. 
He gets safe. He gets off of discoveries. Knight c4 hitting the queen. We're hitting the g2 pawn. So he defends. No trades. And after knight c5, Timon makes a, a decision here. And another reason why I like this game is, remember, players like Karpov, they do not like being attacked. So I guarantee if you look across his moves statistically, he's going to be most inaccurate when he's being viciously attacked by his opponent. So Timon makes an objectively bad move in order to try to shake Karpov to see if he'll play poorly. He sacrifices a bishop to open up Karpov's king. The rest of this game is a clinic in how to just be like, oh, you want to give me a piece to attack me? I'm going to defend, and I'm going to beat you. Love it. Knight e5. Says, okay. If your best attacker is your queen, I offer to trade your queen, and then I'm going to beat you with my extra piece. So Timmons like, nah, I'm, I'm going to try to win. If only Timon had one more move, he's going to take, and then he's going to go there, and then that's going to be mate. No, not going to let you take there. So he's like, okay, so I'm going to put my knight here, and as you can see, the knight and queen are attacking, and then I'm going to mate you. Carpod's like, no, you're not going to take there. I'm sorry. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to go back, because now since you moved your rook, I'm attacking this pawn. Carpod's like, okay. So like, well, I'm going to attack this one. Like, okay, I'm going to attack this one. And right here, if they repeated for the third time, what would that be? A draw. Right. Not a stalemate. Remember, there's multiple forms of draw. That's threefold repetition. We repeated the same position three times. They'd agree to a draw. So Karpov felt like he was better here. So he found another way to defend the pawn, queen e8. And also, when you look at games like this, Another reason great players will repeat the moves twice and then do something different instead of just doing something different the first time is because in most FIDE time controls, you have an increment. So normally it's 30 seconds that when you make your move, you get 30 seconds added to your time. So can you see the benefit of repeating the position twice really quick to get another minute to think with and then play something different? That's why a lot of players, when there's a repetition, will repeat twice and then continue the game if they want to try to win. So, important note. So, queen e8, check. He starts running. Gets rid of an attacker. Check. And it looks like the attack is done. Now, this is one of my favorite things. Watching a knight and bishop beat the doo-doo out of a rook. So we got rook, knight, and bishop versus two rooks. So the so rooks cancel each other out. So basically it's going to be knight and bishop versus rook. Typically the knight and bishop are going to dominate the rook depending upon the pawn structure. Without weaknesses for the rooks to attack, the knight and bishop are just going to keep getting better and poking until something happens. Okay? B5, making sure his knight's not going to be kicked off the beautiful square. So he goes after the weakness. Now nah, I'll defend. Okay. Getting pawns on the opposite color of his bishop, making his bishop stronger. Getting off the pin, because white has the threat of taking the knight, so none of that. Bishop's defending both pawns, flexible. Everybody's working. Slow and steady. Notice how most of the pawns are on the opposite color of the bishop, making the bishop stronger. Karpov's also threatening bishop f5. King e2. So he goes after the weak a pawn. Gimme, gimme. Defense. And white blows up the position because white hasn't had anything to do in a while, so he's trying to make a change. 
make that change. Four. So you want to trade? Here's that knight and bishop thing I was talking about. With equal pawns, it's just rook versus knight and bishop. But watch, the rook just has nothing to do. Bishop defends the chain. So they've got reciprocity. The pawn's defended there. This king's defending this pawn. It gives the knight a free hand in the position to work around. Like, I don't know, say go here to attack this weakness so then we can focus on trying to win. Rook d1. So he's like, okay, if your knight goes there, we're just going to take, and then it'll be equal. So he's just going to use his king to go after the pawn. It's like, no, I'm going to stop your king from getting to my pawn. It's like, okay. I'm going to uh, go ahead and attack your pawn now. You want to take? Because the difference between his king being back one square and up one square, GG. So he checks him. Okay. Check. And here, white resigned. Or ran out of time. Because there is no good move for white. Say he moves the rook down here. Karpov's going to take this pawn and then start gradually moving this pawn until he makes a queen with it. So say, for instance, if check and he does something like this, after a3, if you try to move your rook to get behind the pawn, <laughs> this move knight a4 is very annoying because it blocks the rook's view of where the pawn is going. So that type of idea, you can see how the pawn's just going to keep moving on, and we understand why Timon threw in the towel. So, we have one of my favorite Karl Kahn games, and uh, Bishop B4 check. That uh, that moment right there, it's boom. That for especially players of this variation is a very very instructive move, and it just shows good preparation can win games.